if all of us have to do a DNA test, if they say that all, all of humanity can trace down to mitochondria Eve, mitochondria Eve is the Khoisan people, then what are the chances of you not carrying that DNA? Because if you look at the struggle of the Khoisan people, no one is fighting that fight with him. But when you speak about land and who was here first, and everyone claims the Khoisan, how are you going to say that we are descendants of the Khoisan, but it's not even one of our official languages? It's not even been spoken. Samantha is this percentage black, this percentage Indian, this percentage white, whatever, whatever. There's nothing that's going to say she's this percentage colored. Nothing. It's a, it's a classification that was convenient for the apartheid regime. And they said that we thought after South Africa gains our democracy, they will get rid of that color term, but they kept it. And my question has always been why? Blessed Good Friday, my brothers and sisters, hustlers and hustlets. I just want to appreciate you guys. I'm very excited, and you guys know the only drink that prays for you. Guys, I've got some great news before I introduce my guest today. Reason why I'm so much on a high, I'm excited. Um, it's because I've been off mainstream radio for about a decade, for 10 years. Started my entire career on community radio. I've done campus radio. I've done regional radio. I've done youth radio. I've done national radio. I've done PBS radio. I've done Ukozi, YFM, Rise FM, Vuma FM, Voice of Tembisa. I've done UJFM. I've done Metro FM. I've done Massive Metro, my own radio station, homegrown radio where I train young talent, radio talent. And I'm excited because a lot of my students who graduated from our radio course during the lockdown are now all over the industry. I'm proud of all of you guys. I've been following you. I can't mention you by names because if, if I don't remember you, then you'll be mad at me. Why am I remembering Tato Immaculate? I'm proud of you. You're on Metro now. I'm proud of my sister, Faith Mangope. I'm so proud of you, everything you've achieved. I'm proud of Robert Boy. I'm proud of justify justice i'm proud of uh there's so many of you guys i can go on for the whole day but the reason why i'm doing such a long intro is because i'm going back on radio this coming monday yes i'm back in mainstream radio i'm back at the sabc i'm back where i belong i'm back where i grew up from and i believe it's time to go serve my country just like if you've got skills of being an engineer maybe you are running your own business or you're a doctor you're running your own practice when your country calls on you you gotta have to go and serve so my country calls on me and just like last year my brother sees we're trending you and i uh, i think you're saying something along the lines of radio to tell you the truth my brother i confess being radio i missed it that's why i'm going to eat up that microphone on monday morning what radio station it is i don't know go search it on twitter go google it but you're gonna wake up with me on easter monday today it's good friday for those who celebrated i hope you guys are having good family lunch i hope you enjoyed your time at church some of you guys who are from church is thank you to all those that are congratulating me on the comment section a young person built her career in Johannesburg. Uh, TikTok came, YouTube, Instagram, all these social media platforms came in. They opened up, uh, they opened all of, all of us up into the talent that South Africa has. And the person that I'm sitting with here today saw that opportunity of expressing themselves using social media. They are a creative entrepreneur, just like I am. I've been following their work. I've been following them on social media and they're highly opinionated. They are smart, they're incredible. She's an academic and she speaks her mind. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is Samantha Jansen to The Hustler's Corner. How are you doing? 
I'm very good. Thank you. So. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to have you here, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, Thank you. I'm excited to be here. When we met downstairs, <laughs> I thought we were meeting for the first time today. You're reminding me that we actually did an interview together in 2020. We did. 20 2010 for the 2010 Was it 2010? 2010 for the 2010 World Cup. There was a show called Africa Facts and I was the presenter and I interviewed you one day around the 2010 World Cup. Wow. <laughs> That's the first time I met you. And I actually, I remember I said to my sister, I've been being invited to his boo show. And I don't think he remembers that I interviewed him once because she was there. And I don't, hey? <laughs> I can imagine. And it's crazy because in my mind, I'm thinking you're probably 24 or 25. No. So if it's 2010 World Cup, <laughs> clearly you're not 15. So, no. so clearly you're looking after yourself. Apparently. <laughs> You look young. It's a compliment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for visiting us. Maybe let's start there. What is Good Friday mean to you since today people are enjoying with their families, people are from church, mm -hmm. and some people don't celebrate it for their own reasons? For me, Good Friday, and I think it's probably because it's such a tradition. It's uh, sorry to disturb you. Please come closer to the mic. Uh, maybe you just shift I, your chair no close. Problem. Yeah. yeah. And just be comfortable. I got you. Thank you. For me, Good Friday is about family, you know. Um... Today, we come together as a family. It's a very, I don't want to say colored thing, but it is because I think people know us for pickle fish and hot cross buns, <laughs> which is what we had. You know, but really it is about celebrating. Um, and as a, I'm, I am a Christian, people don't know that because I don't speak about religion. And yeah, Jesus dying on the cross for us. And that's how I, I've always seen it. And it's something that we... We always, yeah, celebrate. I'm glad. Uh, you also <laughs> celebrate Christmas. Obviously, you're Christian. I do. I do. But what is also your understanding of other people who don't celebrate Good Friday? I don't have an opinion about other people who don't celebrate okay. Good Friday. I don't. When it comes to any form of, I'm going to say, religious holidays or religion as a whole, I don't feel like I'm an expert in that. I believe there's a God and you will serve him in whichever manner is beneficial to you. And you find him. That's how I approach it. Yeah, same here. I also mm. respect um, other people's religions, mm. other people's beliefs, yeah. and everybody's got a right to believe in whatever they believe in. Uh -huh. I am a child of God. I embrace God. I talk about God every day. Yeah. Uh, even promote my drink, <laughs> praising you know the Word of God. Like yeah. when you open it, praise for it. For mm. me, it's subtle innuendos where I'm saying to you know the young people that follow my work mm. that uh, I'm a godly person, mm. I'm a believer, and yeah. I'm glad that I'm sitting with another believer. No, I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to that show. Fun Facts 2010. Tell, take me through that time. That was a World Cup. There was a lot of noise in the country. How old were you? What were you doing? Who were you working for? It was so chaotic. And it was. It was very chaotic. Um, I can't remember the production company, but I remember that someone had approached me and they said they're shooting the show. Um, am I interested in auditioning? And I went and obviously I got the gig. And it was focused around the 2010 World Cup. They were set up at the Sandton Convention Center, it was very chaotic, like I said. So they had a lot of celebrities coming in, et cetera, et cetera, you being one of them. And they had secured that interview, and they're like, Sam, you're interviewing Spoo. And you were so polite. You were, of all the people, like, I, I interviewed so many, and you were so calm, very polite, and, yeah, it was a nice interview. It was really about South Africa hosting the 2010 World Cup. How do you feel about it? How will it benefit South Africa? Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. I, I really, really yeah. appreciate it. And, and let's take it there. For me, in my mind, I thought you're a Cape Townian. For some reason, even when I invited you to today's show, yeah. I thought you were in Cape Town. Yes, you did. Yeah. Are you yes. from Cape Town or why do I think you're from Cape Town? No, my mom is from Cape Town. Oh, your mom's from Cape Town. <laughs> my okay, mom is cool. my mom, born and raised in Cape Town. She's now in the Northern Cape. But I always like I I don't know I I think I said this to you. Everyone assumes I'm in Cape Town. I've had a few in last week. I had an invite to a TV show, and they were like, "Hi Samantha, we're shooting on this day. We'd like to have you on. We're speaking about the following. It's a live show." And I was like, "Yeah, sure, I'd love to do it." And they sent me the address, and it said Cape Town, and I'm like, "I'm not in Cape Town." She's like, "Why did I think you're not in Cape Town?" I'm like, "Not all colors are in Cape Town, eh?" Like, we kind of scattered. <laughs> no, 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 no. In my mind, it wasn't a stereotype. I don't know. Maybe it's. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I love Cape Town, and I'm glad. And I'm glad you are in Johannesburg. Were you born in Joburg? No, I was born in the in the northwest. I'm originally from Potchefstroom. Oko Poch. From okay. Mosa Pochestrom. Very few people know where Poch is. Yeah. I know a township called Kumo. 
in, yes. in Boch. Uh, I used to have a close friend, a little bit older than me. Uh, we went to varsity together. Shout out to Papillon Mutsonyane. Papillon Mutsonyane, Papillon Mutsonyane always had money. From when we were still struggling broke students, Papillon was already driving a VR6. <laughs> <laughs> When we graduated, Papillon himself was already a millionaire. <laughs> I don't know where Papi is right now, but one of the coolest, smart dressers, amazing brothers that I've ever had. I miss you, Papi. Anybody that knows Papillon who grew up in Kumo, Kopoch of Strum, just give him a call and tell him. Buddha says hello on the podcast. His sister is Oslebo. Lebo Motsonyan. So shout out to my brother. Poch, I know it very well, but it's on the outskirts of John, like an hour away, right? Literally. It's about yeah. an hour. And it depends on how fast you drive, really. About an hour, 20 minutes max. But yeah, very close. And where did you study? I so obviously went to school there. And then after my dad passed away, we moved to Johannesburg. And then finished school in Bosmond. And then I went to study through UNISA. Got accepted through UJ, but I needed to go and work. So did it through, UJ, to, through UNISA. So you've never stayed in Cape Town? Never in my life. How crazy is that? <laughs> so you go there also as a visitor? I do. I do. I go there as a visitor. Imagine. I'm sorry about <laughs> the loss of your father. How old are you? I was 13. 13? Yeah, I was 13. Sure. I don't want to imagine. It. I'm a father of, I'm a, of, mm. of a girl child, right? How was your relationship with your father? I was very close to my dad. I was very close to my dad. Mind you, we are four girls and one boy. Four girls? Four girls, one boy. I'm the eldest. Older boy. Oh, you're the eldest. Okay. He's the baby. Okay. So when my dad passed, he was like a baby baby. Um, and I was 13. And my dad kind of played mom and dad to a certain degree, you know. And after he passed, it was, yeah, it was one of those things that hits you. But yeah. I'm sorry for the loss of your father. So when you're saying he played daddy and mommy, was, yeah. wasn't your mom around? She was. She was around, but she wasn't present, if that makes sense. No, it doesn't. And I want to, the thing is, because we are five siblings, I remember I told my story to a friend. When I moved to the States, I was in the States for a while, right? And one of my friends had another friend who became a friend, right? And they thought that I come from this wealthy family and this is how I grew up, etc., etc., etc. And she was like, actually, no. Ask Sam to tell you her story. And then when I told him, and this is a man, he stood there and he started crying and he was like, how is that not a Netflix series? <laughs> because it's that crazy. But because we are five, I feel like it's not my place to always speak about something that they would not want to make public information, you know, with regards, especially to our relationship with my mom. So, yeah, but she wasn't very present. She's trying now. And I think it was it was very difficult for her after my father passed away. So that as you get older, you realize, OK, it kind of makes sense now, you know. But, yeah, it's something that. I have spoken to my sisters about and if they're not comfortable me making it public about certain things and I'm like, I get it. But Were you one of those older siblings that had to also play being a mini parent to your younger siblings? Oh no, not even mini. I was a full on parent. Don't say that. I swear. I was a full on parent, not even mini. I was there. Um I I remember being seven and making sure that my, this was before my little sister was born, making sure that my sisters needed to do their homework, washing their clothes, I had to make food. I, it's crazy. Like, <laughs> you're looking at me like, I would like to know what happened. Mm, um, because you had to grow up fast. Very quickly. And very, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of you guys that can relate, like being a parent to your younger siblings. And and even now, this, the dynamics of our relationship is still the same, you know? Um, but you grow up very quickly and then people don't understand. They'll tell you, oh, you're so mature for your age. It's not by force, really. Um, and I always say this, wisdom does not come with age. It comes with experience. It comes mm -hmm. with experience and mine came with experience because for me, can you imagine when you are 13, I lost my dad. And the only thing that I was focused on was I need to finish school and I need to start working because I need all my siblings to be together. That was that was it. That was it for me. My life was I need to finish school and create a structure where we are all together again. Yeah. 
how do you go to America when you're in that position? I went to the States after they were okay. So my sisters came to live with me and my other sister, you know, because so what happened was after my dad had passed, my his sisters took us in, right? So because we were four, yeah. So when, I'm not going to mention names, but when they came to live with us, they went to school and then after they were a bit set and structured, I then was able to pursue the things that I wanted to pursue. Okay. And that was, yeah. So, so in America, it was education? No, it was songwriting and music. Are you, you gotta be kidding me. I, swear, I didn't know that you also uh, was in the entertainment industry. I was. Okay. I was. Was it, was it an opportunity and what happened? So after I'd finished Big Brother. Um, oh, you were Big Brother? I was. <laughs> okay, so you've been hustling. Okay. Been. Okay, maybe let's start with Big Brother. Yes. So after I had finished um, Big Brother Africa, there was a lady that... Uh, sorry to disturb you. Let's start with Big Brother. You going into Big Brother. Yeah. Then we'll talk about America after. <laughs> I got yeah, you. Because I didn't know you were your own Big Brother. I wasn't Big Brother. So I wanted to... It was one of those bucket list situations. Yeah. You know when you have like a... I wonder how this would be. And I I remember it was... You know, strange enough, I remember applying, auditioning, but I knew I was going to get it. You know when there's certain yeah. things where you're just like, this is... If I go, I know I'm going to get it. And I went and I auditioned and it was very smooth. And um, jo, 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 it's so interesting what you're saying. Do you know that for some reason I knew that I'm going to go back to the SABC yeah. at some point? Like I knew. And for some reason, it's like I was expecting that call this year. Yeah. Because I was like, all right, man, time is moving. Yeah, what's going on? Because <laughs> I've been expecting the call. And uh, I'd, I'd made it right with my mind that, mm. you know what, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. So yeah. I've, build, I've been building my company and I'm ready. So I know what you mean when you know you're going to get something. Yeah. So yeah. I've been expecting the call. And when it came, it's so interesting that I got a call from the same person that fired me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a chat for another day. We'll talk about it another time. And then I knew, and then I told him that I've been waiting for this call. I knew you'd call. But it was bound to happen, though. Think about <laughs> it. You were able to do all of this without them. It was bound to happen. Eventually. How crazy. Yeah. So, so I like it when you're talking about conviction and saying you knew. I knew. Why did you know? How did you know? I think there's certain things where you know that you need to do it and you kind of know that's where the direction of your life is at that moment but sometimes we tend to self-sabotage you know and that's why we don't always get to achieve certain things for me i don't know and i wasn't even a big brother watcher it wasn't something that i would say oh i know all the big brother contestants i no i remember i saw it this one time and i was like i love this concept i need to do that and when i was ready and i went to audition I remember I told my sister, and here's the thing, the two finalists, you know, the audition, and then the two top, um, they will choose one girl, one one oh guy. Yeah. It was myself and my sister. They needed to decide yourself. How? I saw so it. it was two girls? It was two girls. Okay. Two, and my, the other girl was my sister. Yeah. But it was something that I was, I just knew. If I audition, everything was smooth. Everything. From the first audition, the second one, every single part of it, I just... I knew that that was that. And let's dwell there in that type of mindset because sometimes when I speak to young people and I tell them about attracting things, you know, they, they sort of don't understand it. How do you get in that mindset where you know that this is mine, I'm going to go through it, and you've just mentioned something now. You said mm -hmm. smooth. Yeah. This is mine, and it's going to be effortless. I'm not going to work too hard because I've already done the work. It'll just effortlessly happen and fit like a hand into a glove. Yeah. How do you get your mind in that space, and, 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 and what happened? Because it doesn't mean like it's magic. It's not. It's not. It's really not magic. I think a lot of that, you know when people speak about manifestation, whether it's manifestation, whether it's God, whether it's the law of attraction, however you look at it. But when you're very clear on what it is that you want to do, I always feel that God will put the opportunities and the people in your life that will take you in the direction that you need to go to. But you need to be intentional and you need to be clear. Because if you're not clear then you will be presented with multiple opportunities and find yourself in a situation that you didn't initially want. So I always say, don't confuse God. <laughs> if you confuse him, then he doesn't know what to do with you. And at that moment, it was something that I was clear on. I needed to take that path. I also knew that it wasn't about me winning. It was just me exploring that opportunity and seeing where it will take me. And how was the experience? It was amazing. 
I'm a bit of a weirdo in that sense. I'm a bit of <laughs> so for me, it was like, <laughs> that was fun. You have no concept of time. You literally have no concept of time. I remember when I came out, my, my sisters were like, you guys will be cooking at three. And then one of you will say, okay, guys, based on what I'm seeing, it's probably like seven, eight o'clock outside. So we'll eat at <laughs> yeah. nine. And she was like, and it's three o'clock. I'm like, no wonder we used to wake up so tired. <laughs> yeah. Because you have no concept of time. You have no idea what's happening in the news. You have no idea. You just don't know what's happening, you know? And that part of just being completely cut off from society is what was intriguing to me. And then being put in a house with people that you've never met from different countries, different cultures, different languages as, a, as an experience. So you did a, a Mzansi one or you did Big Brother Africa? Africa. Oh, you did Big Brother Africa. Big Brother Africa. Wow. Big did you make friends in the house? Yeah, I made a lot of friends. Because that's like a, a decade ago, I'm sure, because now it's different with social media. Because yeah. I see Abu Yolanda, Abu Liema, and, and shout out to all of your guys. And I'm yeah. proud of my, yeah. my, my, my sister Kosi doing well, wi winning last year, mm. and the year before Mpo Abadimu. Mm. So it's evolved, but it's nice to see Big Brother happening in this day and age of social media. Because yeah. yeah. we've been watching it from day one. I remember, you remember Bad Brett? No. Back in the day, okay, <laughs> I'm revealing my age now. <laughs> like the first Big Brother when it started mm. back in the day, it was a bully. It was a very Afrikaner guy was fighting in the house. And really? Yeah, it was an interesting one. No, I don't remember. Yeah, so I missed yours, but so yours was Big Brother Africa. Who won yours? Um, Idris Sultan, okay. Tanzania. Mm. Yeah. What are they doing now? He is a comedian and a, has a is in production. Yeah, he's pretty big. Okay. Yeah. The difference, you know, the one thing about Big Brother Africa, and I picked it up with a lot of the Big Brother African South African contestants, is that Big Brother outside of South Africa is massive. It's huge. It's massive. Like we would, fl you would fly to a country. I remember when we went to Tanzania, and you have fans waiting for you at the airport. Sure. It's the craziest thing. Yeah. South Africa thinks we have celebs, and to a certain degree, we do because it's South Africa. But when you go to other countries, it is crazy. It is crazy. So. Yeah, that's, and a lot of them are doing really well. And a, a lot of them. So even the others who didn't win, so everybody has grown, right? Yeah, yeah, they've all I grown. They've all grown very. Uh, that's I, beautiful. I remember there was, um, she was Nigerian. I, I consider her friend. Her name was Lillian. She's an actor now. Um, there's Luis Munana. He's doing a show now on 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 Netflix called, is it Young Africa and Famous or something like that? Yeah, very yeah, good friend yeah, of mine. Yeah, young, famous, and African. Yes, like yes, that. yes. He's a very good friend of mine, doing very well. Um, yeah, it does. That's dope. When I started out in my hustling days uh, as a teenager, I think I was 19 or 20, around there, before we started TS Records, before I, I even got into the scene, I was a tour guide mm. at Empress Palace. No worries. I worked with a couple of people. One of those people was Bongani Bing, who does the morning show mm. on 702. He was big at the time. He was very chubby. At some point, he presented carte blanche. One of my other colleagues was um, Tumi Shomasha. Mm. So imagine Bongani being what Tumi Shomasha, myself, as youngins, like 19, 20, mm -hmm. 21 year olds. <laughs> and it's so, it's so nice as you're sharing your experience mm. where some of the people that you came up with, like you're so proud of them, they're all doing well. They're you doing know? very well. So I'm so proud of you guys. Um, so it's it's really great to hear you say that. Okay, now let's move into the U.S. now. That's how I ended up in the U.S. How? So what happened was the opportunities in South Africa was not presenting the way it was in other countries. And it was either I needed to move that side. And then one of my friends who is, she's South African and she was working for a production company had a lady from Nigeria come to South Africa for production. And she is into artist management, etc. And Nancy had said to her, no, I know Samantha. And she was like, I want to meet Samantha. And she set up a meeting. I got to meet her. Her name is Victoria, incredible lady. She sat down with me and she was like, Sam, I really think that you will do well abroad. I really think you either need to consider either moving, you know, um, or we try and figure out a structure. But there's the, I think it was the, what is this American... African American um, music event that comes up. It's a big um, awards, but uh, award show Nickelodeon. Yes. No, no, no. For it's, kids? it's it's for it's black. It's African American, specifically African American. Oh, um. Um. Okay. 
BT? There we go. The okay. BT the Awards. BT Awards. Yes, okay, the okay, BT yeah. Awards was coming up. And she was like, I've got invites. Do you want to go? Um, and then when we get to Los Angeles, I want you to meet up with a few modeling agencies and then see what happens there. And then at the same time, there was a friend of mine who was a musician and I'd written a song for her because I'm, you know, and I remember I showed her the song and she was like, you're really good at this. And she was based in the States and she had sent it through to those guys. And they were like, if she ever finds herself in the States, please ask her to meet up with us. So they were in New York. So when I was in Los Angeles, I met up with a few modeling agencies that were all interested. And I was like, okay, but I still need to go to New York and see what New York has for me. And then I went to New York. I met up with these guys and they were interested and they were more on the artist side. And they were like, you've got a marketable look, you know, in terms of, so this is what we, and that's how I ended up in, in, in the States. So I had to choose between focusing on the modeling side or focusing on the music side. And strange enough, New York was, I remember people saying my mouth, my family was very worried. And my aunt was like, it's a new place, you know, it's always difficult when people move abroad, etc., etc., etc. And that wasn't the case for me. Another one of those, when it's God, it's a different opportunity. Because there was opportunities that presented itself that was, that was crazy. You know, that didn't, it didn't even make sense. I remember making friends with someone, we were really just friends, we met at an event at the Hamptons, right? And he was a friend of a friend. Mm, that's a bougie place, Hamptons. Exactly. Yeah. It's a very bougie place. And it was really just, my friend called me and Milan was like, hey, Sam, um, there's this event. Do you want to go? And I was like, sure. And we met these two guys, the one guy she knew, and we became friends. So whenever there were events, they would invite us, we'll go. And just to find out this person works for Rock Nation. Mm. It's like, what are the chances? You yeah. know? But... It was a very effortless thing. It, it was weird how my life in New York played out. Um, if you look at One Oak, you know One Oak, the club, yeah. right? I remember myself in Milan went to, we were like, nah, we're just going to go for lunch. Who, Milan the model? Milan the model. Oh, she's yeah, tall. Tall girl. Yeah, yeah she's yeah. a very good friend of mine. Shout out to Milan. Milan. I haven't seen her in years, Yes, yeah, she's yeah. in the States. Yeah. So she was like, no, sis, let's go um, out for, it was my first week there. And she was like, no, let's go out for lunch. And then we went out for lunch and it became, you know, it went into dinner. And then after that, we were like, okay, let's go clubbing. And I was like, okay, where are we going to go? But we're not dressed to go clubbing. And you know, in New York, it's very much, they put you in a queue and they kind of pick you. You yeah. can come, you can come. Yeah. And, and you have to dress the part because they're very strict. To, they very, if you're not dressed the part, you're not going to They will get in. not let you in. <laughs> yeah. And I was wearing a pair of All Stars and I was wearing a dungaree. <laughs> and we stood there in the queue. And we're standing there and Milan is like, you know, we're not dressed, but hopefully they let us in, you know. So there's this guy and he looks at me. It's one of the bouncers. And there was another guy standing at the door and they're looking at me. And now we're at the back. And then he does this. And I go. And he's like, where are you from? And I'm like, South Africa. He's like, South Africa. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I love South Africa. I'm like, how do you know? He's like, I used to be in South Africa. I'm like, no ways. He's like, yeah. <laughs> um, he's Nigerian. He was a bounce at one of the places in South Africa. He moved to the States. And then the owner or one of the owners or manager was a guy standing there. And he was like, you're from South Africa? And I was like, yeah. And he was British. And we got into this conversation. And then he said, let them in. And... We went in. He put us at one of the VIP tables. And then when we left there, he was like, this is my number. If you guys ever want to come, come. And that was my, from there. I remember literally from my first week in New York, the people that I met, it was incredible. And how long was the experience in the US? It was two years, couple of months. Okay. Yeah. And why did you come back home? I came back home because of family. I came back home because my sister had just given birth. And my nephew was a couple of months and there was a few things that we needed to deal with. And I obviously told you about the family structure. So as the eldest and sometimes the mom, you know, there's certain things that you need to do. So, yeah, I came and I met my now husband. And I stuck around. I'm still, yeah. <laughs> and congratulations. And this is back in Joburg now, right? This is back in Joburg. Yeah. Yeah. And then what did you do? Did you get back here and be like, okay, what am I going to do now? You already had a plan. I came back. Career-wise. I came. So initially what was meant to happen was I was meant to. So we decided that I was going to be between New York and South Africa. And then 
I was obviously still in contact with the guys that side. So we had recorded a few things and then we released one of the songs. And then the focus was then, while I'm here, I need to try and push my... That was when Instagram was still up and coming. You need to start working on pushing up your content, etc. And year one came and I didn't go back yet. And then year two came and then COVID hit. Mm. Then you were just stuck here. And then I was just, yeah. And, and, and COVID literally, and I had this conversation last night and like... COVID took two years of our lives. Yeah, three. And they never, like three years yeah. of our lives and they never gave it back to us, yeah. you know? God owes us three years. Literally three years <laughs> of our lives. And I remember I sat and I was making a list of, okay, what have I achieved like in my 30s? What do I still need? And then I looked at it and I'm like, because I always, I'm like very goal oriented, you know? Yeah. So I write it down. I'm like, something is missing. Like there's a certain part where I feel like I should have done more. Yeah. And I had, my sister was like, COVID. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, COVID took three years of our lives. And mm. I was like, God damn it. Three years that they never gave it back. You know, they and it's never, never gave, coming back. Eh? It's never coming How back. How crazy is it that there's still some people mentally somehow subconsciously still feel. Um, um, or, or let me put it this way. They still can't drag themselves out of, out of that COVID mentality. It That's is. what it did for a lot of people. Yeah, but it's very. It was a very traumatic, traumatic it was. experience. I, I realized it. later that actually I was I was depressed. I, I, was, I, can not imagine. I no. was not aware. I was not I write about it in my upcoming book, but I was depressed. And it would only make sense. Do you know how I, I realized? I remember we had a few friends come into Essay, right? They came to visit and they called me up. They're like, Sam, we're in Essay. This is just after we came out of lockdown, right? And they based in London, so they didn't really go into like hard lockdowns the way we did, and. He said, you guys really went through the most. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, everyone is like, you know, it's it's like, you guys are not okay. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, it's like everyone is on the edge. And I was like, I never realized that. But we were in lockdown. Can you ma- imagine being in confined, like in that space? Yeah. You in your house, we could only go to the shopping center. Remember there was a time where it's only one of the people in yeah. the family that could go. Yeah. Um, that is it is mentally traumatizing. Yeah, it, it messed with us mentally. A hundred percent. And I'm sure there's a whole lot of other people out there like me who are depressed and who are not aware of it, who only got aware of it later. I got aware of it later when I snapped out of it. I snapped out of it by, uh, I went to New York. You know what, what New York does? Yeah. When you, especially when you haven't been there in a while. Yeah. Just the energy, what the city does. And I actually realized, geez, man, I was depressed. Yeah. You know, so... For all those that are going through that, uh, my prayers are with you. But those that got, went through it as well, I just want to say it just takes you being um, positive and just consistently thinking about your dreams and just praying to God all the time, you mm-hmm. know, because it's not an easy thing to 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 mentally lock. We were locked down physically and structurally, mm-hmm. but even mentally it ends up messing you up where you end up drowning into this, um, rabbit hole of negativity and negative thing after ne- a negative thing after the other yeah. and you just keep on digging yourself deeper and deeper down into just that negative rabbit hole and um, it's said that other people can't come out of it but it's a very 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 challenging situation it definitely is do you know I, I, I love watching K-dramas right I don't know if you know K-dramas. Korean no, I don't. Dramas, it, they're massive. You know, they, they, Korea has done an amazing job in the entertainment industry. So in terms of the music and the, the, the series, etc., it's doing really well. So I'm a massive K-drama fan. Okay, I'm a massive Nollywood fan. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. Nigerians, and what I, love, I love you guys. No, I love K-dramas. <laughs> and you know what and I and love about... to Mr. Ibu. Sorry, continue. Oh, no, and you know what I love about K-dramas and what they've done well is telling real stories. Mm. They will tell the most, they, it's they, it's a comedy or a romantic series, etc. But they are able to tell real stories. And there's one that I'm watching right now, right? And I didn't know that it will be about depression, right? So I'm watching it because it's called, they always have these random names. I think because translation is kind of weird. And it's called Dr. Slump, if I'm not mistaken. So I couldn't put like slump, you know, together. Yeah. So I started watching it and it's about two doctors who went to school together. The one was like full on studying all the time, all the time, you know, and she was the top student. And the other one was top student, but not as hectic as she was, right? And then later on, she becomes a doctor and she's successful, etc. And she gets bullied in work and she really wants to be a professor. Now, for you to be a professor, you need to be able to 
write a lot of um, publications, right? And she didn't know she was depressed. So there was a moment where she decided to go and see a psychologist because she almost got bumped. She walked over the road and there was a car that was coming, a, bu- a, a, a truck that was coming towards her. And she kind of, she was about to collapse in the middle of the street, but she could run away. And in that moment, she felt like, what would happen if I just die at this moment? Mm. And then she said it was that part that made her go and see a psychologist. And the psychologist said something about depression. He, she asked him, do I go, can I go back to work? You know, are you going to give me medication? Is life going to go on as normal? And he said, no. He said to her, when you break your arm, do you still go and lift weights? And she said, no. And he was, she, he was like, when you hurt your ankle or your leg, are you still going to run on the treadmill? You're going to make it worse. He said to her, your mind is broken. Do you want to break it further? Mm. And he said, that is depression. People don't understand how severe depression is. It's a mental illness that you need to reset from. And you can only do it by shutting down completely and understanding that I need to recover from this. And I was like, I didn't know. And I mean, we all have our moments of depression where you Mm. slip in and out of depression. It was that deep. But the Koreans have really found a way of attending to life issues through their series in a way that literally makes you look at it like, I never thought about it that way. Mm. Have have you went through uh, mental health issues? Oh yeah, 100%. Yeah, definitely. I have my moments where I'm, where you feel like you haven't done enough and then you kind of go into a slump, you know. I have moments where you miss, like I miss my dad, I miss certain things, you know, where I feel like, And then it happens. I think all of us, whether people are consciously aware of it or not, have moments of slipping in and out of depression. It's really just about trying to find, and that's why it's so important to center yourself and try and find a source that you can retract into and then come back and find a way or coping mechanism. You know, for me, my coping mechanism is working out. And when I don't work out, when I have moments where... All I want to do is sleep. I'm like, okay, I'm not okay. That's how I know. I'm not okay. Um, But I think for the most part, a lot of people deal with depression. A lot of people don't know that they're dealing with depression. And because, especially in a country like South Africa, South Africa's socioeconomic structures or issues at the moment doesn't allow people to even take a step back and say, am I mentally okay to be able to deal with what I'm dealing with? No. So you just need to continue as per normal, especially for men. In South Africa's structures, they teach men, you must be a man, you need to provide, you need to be there all the time. And I remember I had this conversation with um, a group of boys who were speaking about why it's important to speak about things, you know. Um, And I said to them that you are human before you are a man. That's it. Which means human emotions will find you whether you like it or not. And you need to find a way of dealing with it. So find the person that is the closest to you that you can be the most vulnerable to. And in that moment, you can be human, whether it means crying, expressing yourself, saying at this moment, I feel like I'm about to completely lose myself and that person will not judge you. And then you can come back and you be yourself. And men don't have those conversations. Mm. And you should really have those conversations. But it's not, we don't exactly create spaces that are safe enough for them to do that. Uh, it's exactly what you're saying. Like we die inside. Yeah. We keep quiet because society has just created this, this yeah. figment of imagination of a man who just doesn't feel any pain. And he has to go out there and provide like he's a machine. No. And he has to deal with all these things. And, you know, when last was he told that he's loved? When last was he told that, you know, he must keep going? Yeah. When last was he told that he, he's capable, he's incredible, he's got a great future, and it doesn't happen. Yeah. And you can't cry as well because men don't cry, men, men don't, don't cry, cry. Men you don't need cry. to be strong. Mm. You need to just go out there all the time, but it, it, it doesn't make sense. And as much as I'm a believer in terms of, I'm going to say, the structures of being a man and being a woman and being in your feminine and being in, a, in your masculine, it moves and you can move between those. And at times when you do feel, I'm going to say, the human side of you is being triggered. You should find a safe enough enough space to be able to express how you feel about that. Mm. And we do not 
create enough safe spaces for men to be able to say, I am not okay. At this moment, I'm not okay. What do I do? And, and I, I think, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And I always say that I, for me, I, I cannot hold on to emotions. I refuse. I do not want to hold on to emotions. At a moment where I, and at least I have four, I have, we four, we five, right? So my sisters are my safe space and I've never needed, I don't have a lot of friends. I know a lot of people, but I don't have, my friends are my sisters. And I will go there and I will offload. And then I'm, I'll even say, well, even if we're fighting and we're having, and I know, you know what, I've been upset with her for two weeks now, I need to, and I'll call and I'm like, listen, I know you're upset with me, but listen, I need to tell you what happened to me. <laughs> And then I can offload, you know, and that's my safe space because they will never judge me. They will never criticize me. When we are done there, they'll be like, okay, what do you want us to do? And I think that for me is my blessing, whether or not we, like my dad is not around me or we don't have a, a close enough relationship with my mom, although we're trying to fix that, is that we are a chain and we know that. And if the one is broken, the other ones pull you. And I'm very blessed to have them. I don't know if they know that, but and, and people that know that always say, you and your sisters have such a, but it's because they don't know where we come from. So we're like this, but they know. Samantha will offload. If Ray needs to say something, it will be Menta. I need to talk. I'm not okay. How do I fix it? And I'm like, process. When you're done, then we find a solution. And if you need to cry, and I tell this to men also, if you cry, you go into your room, Cry until you cannot cry anymore. When you come back, you can dust yourself out and say, okay, I'm going to be a man now. And you proceed. But you are human. How did you guys grow up without your mom, your mom's presence? And as now that you've grown, how have you been able to, um, or, or when did you make that decision of wanting to create that relationship with her again? With my mom? Yeah. Because as you get older, you realize that a lot of the way you respond to certain things could come from trauma. And I did not acknowledge my mom's trauma because for me it was, she's a mom. She should have been there. She shouldn't have done this, you know. So if I think about it now, I'm like, she was 36 years old when my dad passed away and she had five kids. She didn't know what to do, you know. And at no point did I have the conversation of asking her, what happened to you? Because now I know that where I am now, I can look back and say, the reason I am where I am at the moment um, is because the following happened to me. And that kind of, you know, the following happened to me and you need to attend to it. But she comes from a generation where certain things were not, like we can now speak about depression. We know that a lot of our parents don't acknowledge depression. What depression are you? There's no such thing, you must get up and move. Where with her, I had to look at the situation and later on look and I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, I, I get it. I still don't, I, I still haven't, I still feel like she could have made better decisions. But I don't think that Samantha would have been Samantha if she didn't do that. Were you angry at her at some point? And if not, were your sisters? Yes, I was... I'm not going to say I was angry, you know, and I think because she wasn't as present as people normally would have a mom be, but I was disappointed. I was disappointed because I felt like the one time when she needed to step up because my dad had always done that for her. She was able to slack at moments, right? She didn't do that. So it was that mo one moment. But um we, my sisters and I have this conversation all the time and, and she actually said the last time and she was like, you know, one of the best decisions mom made for us, whether or not we were able to acknowledge it at the time, was to leave. It was one of the best decisions. And now I can look at it and I'm like, thank you. And I remember I called her up a few months ago and I think for her it was a shock. Um, and I called her and I said to her, just, hi, mommy, how are you, you know? And she said, no, I'm fine, Menta. And I said, no, I needed to say sorry. I didn't understand, but I do, you know? And if at any point in time I was too hard on you, I want to apologize. Um, but I need you to also do better. Not for me. I'm a bit grown now. But if you can do it for Enzo and you can do it for Ray, then I'm okay with that. Do you understand? So, and you make, how oh, you're really good at this. No wonder you're going back to radio because these are things I would never speak about. 
Um, <laughs> we have to inspire the people um, out. And thank you for, and, and thank you. I'm, I don't take this for granted. It's not yeah. easy for us to tap into that space yeah. and our pain and yeah. what we've had to go through. But we do these things for, for our younger people out mm. there, you know, and people who are going through similar situations. Yeah. You're not alone. Guys, you, you're not alone at all. Yeah. You're not alone. Just always know that you're not alone. I know you're going through the most, but you're not alone. We all have stories, you know? Yeah, it's true. We do. We all have stories. And yeah, we had that conversation and we actually, she spoke about a lot of things and that's how I was able to, you look at it and you're like, yeah, I get it, you know, and I feel sorry for her. There's a lot of moments where I'm like, I feel sorry for her and it's very sad that she wasn't able because my aunts played a major role, right? She didn't have that and they were also five and she was the eldest. You know, so mm, 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 mm. what are the chances? From being the eldest, looking after her own siblings yes. to her having, having five, five babies. babies. And then, and then she then was like, I know me, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> that, that, this is not going to Aww, work for me. Shame. This is not going to work for me. And and my aunt and them raised us. And now mm. you look at it and I'm like, she actually made the best decision for us. Mm. Whether she thought it through, I don't know. If it was a conscious decision where she thought, okay, if I do the following, this will be in the best interest of my children. Or whether it was a selfish decision. Because at the moment, at that time, I thought it was very selfish. Now I'm like, okay, maybe it was the best decision for her, for us, because of how we turn. Because my sisters are doing really well. All of them. They're doing, my siblings are doing very well, you know. Um, but it could have easily gone the other way. Easily, easily gone the other way. Have your siblings forgiven her? Yes. Um, she has a much better relationship with my younger siblings because they do not remember a lot of the things, which is good, you know. So they they okay. Um, myself and the one after me, we have gotten to a point where it's, you go for therapy, you have the conversations, um, and then you start looking at it and you're like, okay, yeah, you, you get there. It, it, it's not, you can't be angry forever. Do you understand? Like you, you, and when you're angry, what are you angry about? And for how long? Because it, it, eventually you get to a point where you're like, you hold on to anger so much that you can't even recognize where it comes from. Now it becomes a personality trait, you know? Um, so yeah, that's... <laughs> Did I, you Sorry, I really, there's, there's certain things I don't have a problem speaking about. But like I said, for my siblings, I don't, it's not something that they would necessarily want to do. To, to, because if I could, I would tell you certain things where you'd be like, Samantha, there's no way. And I'm like. Mm, because usually it's the other way around. It's the dead that's not around. Yes. For many people, for most people out there, your story was extraordinary. And the fact that you guys turned out great. I mean, mm -hmm. you're saying all your siblings are doing well. Oh, my siblings it's are doing highly well. unlikely. So God has played a really big role in your yeah. family. Yeah. And how is your mother now? And, you know, how is she? Is she back in Joburg? Is she still based in, 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 in the, in, you said Northern Cape, she, She's right? in the Northern Cape now, yeah. Yeah, is she there? She's in the Northern Cape. She's doing well. I think she's doing well. You nice. know, I had a conversation with her a few days ago. She actually called and she was like, hey, Minta, I haven't spoken to you in a while. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we have a better relationship now, you know. But we have a better relationship because I've grown. I've matured. I understand. I'm a bit more conscious of why it is that people make the decisions. Sorry. That they make. And one of, I read it. I remember I came across this quote once that said, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. And I needed to look at it. And the moment I started looking at life that way, I realized that people do not necessarily respond to you based on what you did, but based on their own experiences of life. You know, so she's trying to do better. She's 100% mm. trying to do better. She's trying to be present. Um, and I appreciate her for that, you know. I, I, I appreciate her consciously trying to become a better mom. Yeah. I did a video on YouTube. I think, guys, it was a few months ago, maybe late last year. 
I said, if your parents are still alive and you don't have a good relationship with them, try as much as you can, no matter how difficult it is, to try and mend that relationship. Because one day when they're no longer around, you're going to wish you could have you, you could have tried to do something to reconcile. I know you probably have tried everything and you don't have a good relationship with your father or your mother. But my advice to you, as I've gotten older myself, I miss my fathers. May my fathers, both of them, rest in peace. My stepfather who brought me up in Tadele Obe passed on in 2017 and um, my biological father passed on in 2009. The older I become, the more I want my father here. The more I want um, certain questions answered, right. the more I feel like my father would be here and, and have a man-to-man -man conversation with me, you know, and, um, and I, I don't want that for anyone. I don't wish that for anyone else out there because you will get there as well. Might be not now. You might be mad at them like, no, I don't want to see my mother. Don't want to see my father. Try and go and mend the relationship with your father or your mother. And if you are the parent and probably you've been a deadbeat dad for whatever reasons, maybe you are not given an opportunity to see your child. It's not your fault. Try everything. Try using the law if you have to. Sometimes try even sneaking into your daughter or your sons or your children's school so you see your children. So even when they're older, they can see at least dad put in an effort. Mm. Like you got to do something because family comes first. I and see it all, man. Family first. And you need it. You're right. You get to a point where you just like, I remember when I, I was, when I first went to go and see a psychologist, right? I was like, no, there's a few things I need to process. And I went for therapy, et cetera. And this woman said something to me. And I remember thought, no. She said to me, I was about 24. And she said to me, Sam, by the time you hit 27, and she was very specific, she said, you're going to want your mom. And I was like, there's no way. I've never needed my mom. I never wanted my mom. And I swear, I hit 27 in a couple of months. And I woke up one day and I wanted my mom. Mm. I, I wanted someone to say it was going to be okay. I wanted to go to... You know, they always say that, if everything else fails and everything else falls apart, you want to go to a space that is the safest place for you. And that's your parents. And that's your parents. And I wanted her, you know, and I couldn't understand it. And she was so correct. And I'm very fortunate because I've had my aunts there, you know, who have played a very present role. Um, my dad's elder sister took raised us, right? So she became like a motherly figure to me. And she passed away in 2019. I'm sorry. And I remember, um, I've actually had a lot of, I've, I've lost a lot of people throughout my life, actually. Mm -hmm. And I remember when, so she was sick at the same time that my uncle was sick. So my uncle was her husband. So they were sick at the same time. She was in the hospital in, in, in Potterstrom and my uncle was in Johannesburg. So my family in Port were like, no, we'll attend to her. And then you attend to your uncle in, in Port, you know. So we go, you do the hospital visits, make sure he's okay and whatever. And the day before she passed, I remember my, my cousin and them called and they said, Menta, I know you guys need to come to porch, but this is in the evening. So now my sister and I are like, do we drive down like now or do we do it in the morning, you know? And I kept on thinking, we should probably do it now, but it's like after eight already. And we're like, okay, no, we'll do it in the morning. And then the morning I got a phone call and her number popped on my phone. And I remember I looked at it and I was like, oh, she's still okay. You know, because it's her number. And then the person on the other side was my cousin. And I'm going to cry. And she was like, hi, Menta. And I was like, hi, Kana. And, she said, and I said, can I speak to my aunt? Let me speak to Jay. Mm. And she was like, Menta. And she, I'm like, I need to speak to Jay. Mm. And she was like, Menta. And then she was like, Jay passed away this morning. Oh. And... The only thing, I wanted to hear her voice so badly. So I remember I went to um, my phone and I tried to file all the pictures of her. I needed to find videos. I sent messages to my family. So I was like, please send me a, a video of her. I just want a video of her. I just want a video of her. I want to hear her voice. And I couldn't find a video. And then this one day I came across one video and I still have that video where it's my nephew and I in the back seat, my sister's driving and we're driving from Porsche. My aunt is in the front and her and my sister are having a conversation. And they said something and we were laughing. And my, my aunt was very, very funny. It was very, very funny. And 
she was speaking about my sister that owes her 10 rand and now my sister wants to borrow another 10 <laughs> rand because you know when you're driving from port you have these people selling things mm. and my sister wanted to buy something that was 10 rand and she's like no fat you're not a 10 rand from my yard. <laughs> that is one of my most prized possessions that is one of my most prized possessions i'm a very sentimental person so 100 percent, what you said now we don't at that moment, realize the important part that they play, you know. And yeah, if uh, there's there's certain fathers where you just like, I would probably, it's, there's a lot of stories that I used to work with a lot of orphanages and I used to work with a lot of schools, you know, and you listen to a lot of stories where I'll be the first person to say, cut that person off. At this moment, you do not need a father that is mentally or sexually, etc., abusive or a mother that does the same. I will do that. But eventually, as you grow and you are more understanding of life and what could have led to them being a specific way, your approach to them is different. So then you're right in saying that you then try and heal and try and mend a relationship as best you can in a manner that if they are not there anymore, it does not haunt you for the rest of your life. Yeah. I get you. My book is coming out in a couple of months' time. I went down through a library of my old pictures when I was a child. I can't find a picture of me and my dad. Oh, Samantha. You. You know, I don't have a picture with my dad, even a single video. Nothing. You know, I just have pictures of him in his 20s, good looking, he was a hunk and all of that but it's like yo like i don't even have like a video with my father mm -hmm. so that's why i'm saying these things like record as many videos as you can create as many memories as you can um travel take them out for lunch for whatever even if you don't have money just visit them just sit with them for two three hours mm -hmm. just create as many memories as you can because there's people like us who wish our parents were still around and I'm just grateful for the fact that my mother is still alive and I'm always grateful. I speak to my mother every day. I love you, mom. I love my mom so much. And I'm saying this and, and, and seeing that you're being vulnerable mm. and you went all the way down there to share with me your story. That's why I'm also opening up. So you feel comfortable that mm. you don't feel you're exposed alone. I, I'm not afraid to share these stories because I even write about them in, in, in the book. I just wish, even just, even if just God can borrow me my dad for one day. Just one day. You know what I mean? Just one day. I hear you. <laughs> you, know you can I mean? just like, <laughs> you know, what you know just can we make a list of everything you want. You know that there's something that I remember when my dad passed away, right? My aunt said something to me and I actually gave her the same advice. One of my aunts recently when her mom passed away, she said to me, um, I mean, I was 13. And mind you, my dad passed away a day before my birthday. Mm. So for the longest time, myself and birthdays were like. So she came to me because everyone knew I was very close to my father, right? And she came to me and she said to me, Sam, everything that your dad needed to teach you to take you through life, he has taught you. And best believe you have been equipped to attend to life. And I was 13 and I was thinking, this auntie, like... What does she mean, you know? And I look at myself now and a lot of who I have become is because of things that my father said to me. One of the lessons that have stuck to me and I couldn't understand it then, he constantly used to say, you are not superior or inferior to anyone. Anyone. So you treat people equally and fairly at all times, right? That was one. He said... You should always, because remember we were four girls first before my little brother. You should always, as a woman, be more than just a face. Always. So you read and you equip yourself. And if you don't know, you ask. And if, even if you need to look stupid for that moment, you are not stupid, you are ignorant. And there's a difference between ignorance and stupidity. Ignorance is I don't know, but I will learn. And that's how I've, I've, I've approached my life. So people always say, how do you know these things? I grew up with a father that said, read the newspaper. You'll say to my sisters, you read that, yes, yes, yes. When you're done, tell me what did you read, you know? And then you need to explain, okay, and this is politics. You're reading newspapers, you understand? <laughs> so those are, are, are things that stuck with me. So whenever I speak to my nieces and my nephews, etc., I always tell them, you must read. You need to be a hundred. And as I've grown older, I've realized that. Because when I was younger, 
I, I've been hustling for such a long time and you f- I find myself in spaces having to present to big, important people. And I know that in my 20s, I remember this one time I had a presentation and there were CEOs there, right? And I unfortunately, I had to do the presentation because the person that needed to do it was not there. And this guy that I was working with, he was doing events. Well, I was doing events for him because he used to do these and these weekly meetings of connecting people from the same sectors. And then I was the only woman there, literally the only woman, mm. aside from my sister that came to help me. And I started speaking, you know, and I started presenting and I spoke and I spoke. And these men just looked at me. And then, but you know, for a moment, it was like, there was a judgment first because really what is this little girl going to say to us? What could she possibly have that's worth value? And when I was done, this one guy came to me. Obviously, later on, you start they start eating and drinking and then you start having conversation. But this one guy stopped when I was done and he said, can I just say something? You are one of, and I was so, and I, he said, you are one of the most impressive women I've ever met. And I was like, and you know, you were very, and I'm like, and he was like, I did not expect you to sound the way that you do. But more importantly, I did not think that you would deliver something of any value to all of us. Like, you know, and it came from him. It came from my father making sure that he said, you will find yourself in spaces and places and you need to at all times be able to meet them on their level. And if you don't, you ask and you learn. And that's been my approach. <clears throat> Okay, let's move on to another topic, man. It's um, let's get a bit light. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for going there. No, no, no. Yeah, I knew I knew that our conversation would be interesting, and we haven't even scrapped the surface yet. <laughs> <There's so much. laughs> All right, let's get into this one. You've lived in the states. Mm. You're in South Africa. The concept of colored yeah. in America and in South Africa. Yeah, the concept of colored. Let's I've, go there. I think you've seen what's <laughs> happening on social media, right? <laughs> let's go there. <sighs> With Tyler, right? And everybody else. Well, it's, it's such a complicated... All over the world, right? Everyone, everyone. And it's such a complicated conversation. And I, there was a girl, I did a podcast a few weeks ago and she was very upset with me. She was a creator and she was like, how dare you speak about what you don't know? But the thing is, I will never go and speak on something that I have not researched and understood, right? And if I don't, I always say teach me so I have a better view of certain things so when you speak of the colored community we are so different we are different in 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 terms of how we look we are different in terms of what we sound like but there are certain commonalities that you'll be able to pick up whether you're light skin colored or dark skin color there's certain things that you just know and people always ask me how do you guys distinguish between them and I'm like it's either the name will give them away if it's not the name you will hear the accent um, there's certain words that they will use <laughs> that yeah. you can tell, even Awe. if it's a da- exactly. <laughs> you know when they say dala, exactly. <laughs> there's certain things that you just know. But I read something. Have you ever heard of of the um, Act Nine reserves? No. And that is why the colored com- community is such a difficult conversation. Um. I think it was during apartheid or before, I know before apartheid, if I'm not mistaken. Remember, there was a lot of slaves that was brought into into South Africa, specifically in the Cape, right? Yeah. That is why the colored community of South Africa have the most diverse genetic makeup in the world. Because you had Malaysians, you had Indonesians, you had Indians, you had the Dutch, the French, etc., etc., right? And also they used it as a pit stop to go, f- to, to trade. So when they came, there was obviously, right? But you must remember these... Was, they were slaves for the most part. So what happened was the descendants of these women, right, were then taken to what they re- refer to as the Act 9 Reserves. And the Act 9 Reserves was colored or so-called colored people that were put in different parts of South Africa, completely removed from society, Right. And I think there was a few in Cape Town, in the Northern Cape, in the Free State, etc. But I've read about it. I've never, ever met someone from there until last week. So I went, I don't know if you know Bianca. Bianca is a a content creator, white lady. She speaks about um, unlearning apartheid ideology. She calls out racism, discrimination. Great content creator, right? And they were having a conversation around white South Africans. 
and it was you know you you want to hear what happens between the white in the white community <laughs> and they were basically calling out um white people in certain parts and then i went into this live and i'm listening and then i obviously went on and i just wanted to say thank you i said thank you for having these conversations you know and for consciously trying to unlearn it and this one lady came on um her name was dione and she spoke about being from one of the the act 9 reserves and she actually said that she didn't know that what white people and black people looked like until she needed to move out of the reserves to go and study mm. she had seen them on tv but she had never met a black person or a white south african sure they are still there that's why the more you learn about the colored community the more i realize there's certain things that you cannot touch on and there's certain things that's why when people are, i used to be very against i'll be like do you know what they should really just remove that color term they should remove the color term but then you read things where they say that the colored community those reserves do you know how they they split them <clears throat> and she told me this she was like she sent me an article also and she explained it she said that when they decided to segregate the colored communities first they segregated them from their families then they segregated them according to hair texture color eye color mm, mm. so now it was oh you've got blue eyes you go there mm. you've got lighter skin you go there mm. you've got green eyes you go there your hair texture is coilia so you go that side you look more indian you go that side you have straighter hair you go this side mm. they it it's not a simple conversation mm. and when you understand that it's not a simple conversation when south africans go off at night i really respect them when they do that because i always say as africans we need to respect each other's the cultures we need to respect each other's histories and if you don't know the history maybe it's best that you don't speak on it and there's certain things i can confidently say i don't know i'm still learning about it um but the color community is a fun community man mm. they're a nice group of people um but i sometimes feel that people are very harsh towards a specific group of people that did not ask to be there right and i'm going to give ask you a question if a woman gets raped who do you blame the man or the woman if a woman gets if raped a woman gets raped who do you blame, blame the man you blame the man mm. if the woman falls pregnant from that child what do you do with the child from rape from rape what do you do with the child what do you do with the child you bring up the child with you bring love bring up the child mm. with love now if you look at the colored community is that not a similar situation in most cases it is exactly mm. it's a similar situation mm. but yet the approach to the colored community is almost it's they have chosen and yes we can now consciously and learn a lot of things and some have intentionally almost because you've got access to so much information to un, um to 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 understand where you come from and that's why i say we're so different in different parts of south africa so when you choose ignorance you you choose it you literally choose to not understand certain why certain people act a specific way but i i have taken it upon myself to to not become a spokesperson for certain things that i do not understand to that degree mm. not always the relationship between the colored community and the khoisan people mm. the indigenous people of where we are in south africa the relationship between the colored and i think i feel like it's a very convenient relationship for most people because for me <laughs> i look at it like it's it's the same people it is the same people It's the same people but then again if you do a DNA test what are the chances of you not having koi blood Think of it if you think of all South Africans if all of us have to do a DNA test if they say that all South, all of humanity can trace down to mitochondria eve mitochondria eve is the koi san people then what are the chances of you not carrying that DNA or me not carrying that DNA There was um what's this lady's name um she's not African American she is short hair dark in comple- complexion she became very famous after the movie 12 years a slave of slavery i think it's that's the one lupita nyong'o lupita nyong'o yeah she did a dna test and where did her dna take her to 
mitochondria if Khoisan people. So I understand where the conversation comes from. However, you cannot have that conversation and assume that the rest of the Africans are not connected to the Khoisan. And that's why I said it's a very convenient conversation. Because if you look at the struggle of the Khoisan people, no one is fighting that fight with them. But when you speak about land and who was here first, and everyone claims the Khoisan, but they are fighting their own fight by themselves. No, we can all say we are descendants of the Khoisan, but who's fighting with the Khoisan? They literally, we are all, we will all carry, look at um, Nelson Mandela, right? I, I think he speaks, he had spoken about the fact that he's a descendant of the Khoisan, and you can see. You can see the features. You can see the I features. I wanted to say that. When you look at data, you can see the features. A hundred percent. And he spoke about it, right? He's a descendant of the Khoisan. He's Kosa, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Kosa. Uh, yeah. And to say that it's only the colored people that are descendants of the uh, would be incorrect. Mm. And obviously we're going to use that because people will come at me if they see this and like, no, you need to say the Kwe and the Kam, Kam people. But we use it because that's the most well-known term, you know, to, of, of the Khoisan people. But for the most part, if we all were to do our DNA, we will all trace back to them. But yet we allow them to fight their fight. By, because when you go to Namibia, ask them where the Nama people are. They are there. Ask them where the Khoisan people are. They are not only there. They are there. They know their cultures. They know their traditions. They speak their languages and they proudly own it. South Africa, it's not that clear. There's very few. I know in the Northern Cape, there are... And this lady that I spoke to, Dionne, she said she's Nama, right? She can still speak the language, like her grandmother speaks the language, etc., etc. So they're there. So it, I, I, it's not. It's a convenient conversation. And in a South, in South Africa, where we've become a very capitalist community, we seem to want to capitalize on an opportunity when it presents itself. You cannot acknowledge the Khoisan when it's convenient to you. So now we're having a conversation about land. So it's convenient to be a descendant of the Khoisan. It's a very convenient conversation. However, when we have the conversation of should the Khoisan have any presence in terms of structural, structural talks in South Africa, maybe. If, we are all, if they are the, the fathers and mothers of us all, should they not be involved? Then suddenly no. Then it becomes very political. And yet they, they, I think they're in the coat of arms, are they not? It's Khoisan that are they. they there's a conversation of Tabum Beki when he spoke with a group, I think it was Khoisan leaders, um, about how they went about um, putting together, what was it? I can't remember what he was speaking about, but he consulted with a few of them and they said the best people to speak to will be the Nama people from Namibia because they know the culture and the language better, you know? And he speaks about understanding where we come from. And to a certain degree, we all will trace back to that. So we dismiss everything else, but we don't acknowledge the one thing about them, which is that these people are being... How are you going to say that we are descendants of the Khoisan, but it's not even one of our official languages? It's not even been spoken. It's not even means... It's not even... There has never been a conversation about should the Nama language be an official language that should be taught in the schools if we acknowledge that we are descendants of the Khoisan people? Should we not respect them at least to a specific degree to, admit, uh, to acknowledge that part of us? No, we don't have that conversation. But if we have the conversation of who was here for the land, oh, then we are all there. We are present. So it's very political. It's very beneficial when it suits us to have that conversation. And it's not just the colored people. It's South Africa as a whole. We don't have the conversation about the Khoisan people, their presence in South Africa, whether or not they get acknowledged, why they do not get acknowledged. When you were growing up, you were saying earlier on in the beginning of the interview that, you know, some, some of your friends in the past have mentioned things like your life should be a life, should be a, a <laughs> docu-series yes. or, or, or a movie on Netflix. Um, were you brought up under, and and I understand that you know your your dad passed on at an early age and your mom's wasn't around. What is your idea of people um, culturally slaughtering or following their culture, 
what, what was your culture and what is your experience as far as that's concerned? Why am I saying that I'm including that on the um, colored people conversation? For me, it was a... So, and I think you, you, when you go to different provinces, go to the colored communities, go to the colored communities and you'll see how close we are to, in terms of traditions, to, to black South Africa. Do you understand? And that's why for me, I always say this now. Always, please don't come for me, guys. It's for me. I am black by race and colored by culture. I own it. It's me. I'm not putting it on other people. They can take it whichever way they want to. And the reason I'm able to say that is when you go to Potchestrom, if you go to Promosa, you will see that we have, we never knew that there was a separation between colored and black. We really just thought we were one people, right? So it was only when we came to Joburg where you realize there's a clear separation in terms of this is the colored community, this is whoever, this is whoever, etc. And in 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 Potters room specifically, like my aunt and them, my aunt and them speak Twana, the Twana very um sorry, Twana very fluently, right? And it's my aunt, it's my cousins, my sisters speak Twana, my little sisters, because they grew up in, 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 in Potterstrom, they speak Twana fluently. But then I grew up with a father that would bring in someone and he will say, hi, this is Sibusiso, he's your uncle. <laughs> hi, this is whoever from Zimbabwe, he's your uncle. <laughs> yeah. Then you see this white man, he's your uncle. Everyone is your uncle, you know? <laughs> yeah. And everyone is your aunt. And that's also whether you are not superior nor inferior. You treat everyone equally. But there are certain color communities in South Africa that have found a way to integrate, right? Um, and hence, they cannot see a s separation or distinction between themselves and the black community unless you tell them to, unless you tell them they don't know. And my sister and I always speak about, so there was this, this um, one of our friends, right? In Poch, his name was Vusi. <laughs> Now, I mean, Vusi is clearly a vernac. It's a vernac name. It's, it's a, but it did not hit me for a second that Vusi is classified black and I am colored. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. What do you mean? This, this is, and my dad was like, yeah. It's like, um, I think there was this girl called Muka, you know? And I think this, I think I could be wrong. The surname was Muketsi and that's where the... But we didn't know that. Muka lived a few houses away from us. Vusi was a, a, one of our best friends. You know, so in, in Potchestrom, the integration between the colored and the black community is effortless. Um, and it, 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 I spoke about it on my TikToks and a few people were able to say it's the same in the Eastern Cape. Like I've got family in the Eastern Cape, right? My cousins speak Kosa fluently. Light in complexion, straight, curly hair, fluently. For them, it's it's like no, but the, like we're the same people. Cape Town, it's a very different situation. It's a very sub different situation. Again, something I've decided not to speak about because the more I read about it, the more I realize not my place. Until they decide to consciously read and have an understanding of certain things, they will approach it in in in, in a different manner. I have a a Twana background, right? My dad comes from a very diverse um group of family members my mother very my dad made sure that we knew that we've got black family members that we've got colored so-called colored we've got indian family members from my mom's side i found out recently that my mom's i think her great grandmother is white and i'm like what do you mean <laughs> you know <laughs> and she was like yeah um and obviously I found out recently because I told you about the relationship, you know, mm. and my sister wanted to know. So Raya was like, Sam, I've always thought because so one of my sisters, I was living in Dubai. She moved to Dubai, was working there and people thought she was Emirati and she was able to blend in so well. And she was like, I need to know what our genetic is, like what is our, what is in our DNA? And I, I obviously asked my mom. And she had to break it down. And she was like, no, your grandmother, this is this race. Your aunt, yeah, was this. Your grandfather. Like my grandfather, my mom's dad is Indian, Indian from India. So, so, so you, you, are a, <laughs> you are a true definition of a rainbow, rainbow child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Literally. My mom's, my mom's dad, Indian. Indian, Indian. So I've been very fortunate 
and very blessed to have grown up in a community where there has not been a separation because it has allowed me to approach my life in a manner that has been inclusive of everyone, right? And not think that there is a hierarchy to a specific racial group. And remember, with the colored community, it is a classification. They don't want to have that conversation. It is a classification. There is no DNA for colored. If I do a DNA test, they're going to say, Samantha is this percentage black, this percentage Indian, this percentage white, whatever, whatever. There's nothing that's going to say she's this percentage colored. Nothing. It's a, it's a classification that was convenient for the apartheid regime. Mm. And it's stuck. And my question has always been, after, and I watched a documentary where they interviewed colored people in Cape Town, right, older people, and they said that we thought after South Africa gains our democracy, they will get rid of that color term, but they kept it. And my question has always been why? Why? Because the ANC government had a choice to make about the, what they knew was a racial classification that was used to segregate black and brown South Africans and create, create a division, but they kept it in place. Why did they keep it in place? And then when you look at and go into politics, during the 1994 elections, and I found this very interesting, what do you think would have been the outcome in the different provinces of who would have won based on our, our history? Which political parties would have won in all, in all the provinces? At that time. At the time, 1994. 1994 yes. ANC. So you think that they won in all the provinces? Yeah, I think so. Not in the Western Cape. Are you serious? 1994 elections? In the 1994 elections, the NP, the National Party, which was the apartheid government which is, party. Which is now the DA, which is which a remix is now of the, the DA, mm. Exactly. Won the Western Cape based on the colored vote. So a lot of the colored people voted for the NP at that time? Yes, because they thought that they would be the best to lead and they did not see how the black regime would be able to lead them. And if you look at Cape Town or the Western Cape right now, you still see a lot of it has moved all over. You know, it, it's a very um, generational thing. It has spilled over. It yeah. has spilled over. It's yeah. 100% spilled over. Um, but I remember I read this and I was like, in 1994? Because me, I would have thought it happened a few elections after. 1994 elections. Mm. What do you say to people who say... Um, Obviously, it was imposed on us. Yes. You know, we didn't do it to ourselves. What do you say to people who say um, colored people sometimes think they're better than black people? I will say... Or, or they feel maybe they're closer to white people. I think it's, again, it, it comes down to grooming. And, and then it, I think it brings in that conversation of light skin privilege as well, yes, right? Yes, mm. it comes into... It's your. It's what's the most beneficial for you in a society that has been groomed to assume that your proximity to whiteness will be more beneficial to you, which unfortunately we have seen is true. It is true. We do treat people of a lighter skin tone, a specific hair texture, a specific way. And if a young... If an individual realizes that my proximity to whiteness and me embracing it is the most beneficial to me, they hold on to that. And they will fight it, right? So, is it true? Yes, but not all. Not all. A hundred percent not all. We do know that there are some kind of... There was, there was a guy that was literally fighting me in a comment section of this podcast that I did about the colored people explaining how some of the colored communities came about and he was literally arguing that he does not have African. He just needed us to know that he's got no African blood in him. But he's colored. But he's colored. <laughs> <laughs> he's colored. He's, and I'm like, are you, and you know, obviously people engage him as well. They're like, are you listening to yourself? It's like, yeah, but she's not being truthful because it's not all of us. And she's basically make it sound like, she's <laughs> making it sound like some of our grandmothers did not choose interracial relationships. And I didn't say that. You know, I said some. But when you are a slave, how much, uh, how much choice do you have? None. Do you understand? If you are literally, 
did the ha- really so i was like my friend you are literally fighting just to for us to say okay you you do not have any black in you if it makes you feel <laughs> yeah, then by all means a hundred percent myself i can speak for me mm. and what i know is that a lot of colored people do have black dna right it's obvious i mean you can see <laughs> some people think i'm twana you know people look at me like you look like you could be Khoisan. And I'm like, yes, I know. I really need to check this out, you know, so I can flaunt it and let people know. Um, but there's a lot of people that don't want to. They don't want to acknowledge it. And it comes down to having to unlearn certain things, but also understanding that we live in a society that has been created where our proximity to whiteness is more respected. And that is why people bleach. That is why people straighten their hair. That is why people dye their hair blonde, etc. Um, and I'm not saying if for everyone it's because they want to, but you do know that if I am of a specific skin tone, I will be treated differently. If I have a, I'm of a specific racial group, I will be, you know. And in South Africa, if you look at the apartheid system, the hierarchy, there was a hierarchy. They had categorized us into what benefits will apply to specific racial groups. Mm. And people have hung on to that. I don't know how it benefits them now. Really, I wish they could tell me how it benefits them now. But the one thing I'm very concerned about in South Africa, and I remember I read this when I saw it in the Unemployment Equity Amendment Act. Remember, there was a whole discussion last year about colored people will not be employed, what are our stories? And I read the act and I needed to understand where it came from to see what it means. Um... And obviously, a lot of it was taken out of context against the Democratic Alliance doing what was best for them and it misinterpreted it. But there was something that stood out. It said, African, colored, Indian, Asian, right? Which fell under BE and they needed to create a system that allows for inclusion of everyone. My concern was that colored people were separated from black. It wasn't colored African or African coloreds. It was colored. Mm. And in a few years time, in about 10, 20, 30 years time, that very same community will have to claw their way out to be recognized as black in South Africa. Mm. And the cycle will continue and to the their cycle children. will continue. Mm. That's why it's important, the decisions that we make now. We're going into the elections now. You spoke about 1994. Mm. How does the Cape Town vote look like in the, 19, oh, sorry, in the 2024 elections? Cape Town, <laughs> you know, Cape Town. Everyone is gunning for Cape Town. Literally, everyone is gunning for Cape Town. Um, and with that being said, I also would like to hear your thoughts on um, Cape Independence. Cape Independence. <laughs> 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 uh, so, we do know that, that the, the DA will have lost a lot of votes in Cape Town. Whether or not they like it, it it's, it's reality has happened. Um, the NCC have actually garnered a lot of voters and membership in 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 western cape and i always feel like they should they 100 percent should and not only in the western cape in the whole of south africa south africa is too diverse to only be ruled by a specific group of people and by group of people i mean one specific political party to be the ruling party that thinks that they can attend to everyone's problems. When the Western Cape's problems is not similar to, the, to North West problems, nor is it similar to Limpropa's problems or Houting's problems. If the colored population is the highest population in the Western Cape, from what you have seen for the time that the Demo- Dem- Democratic Alliance have ruled there as the provincial government, do you think that there has been any representation for them? No. Do you think that anything has been done for them? Not only them, even Bumakukule, Tunyanga, Langakailicha, etc. There hasn't been much that has been done in the town, in the black townships and Nothing. communities, in colored communities. Nothing. The problems and just the videos that you still hear, even today in 2024, mm. about what's going on in the Cape Flats, it's appalling. And then you hear John Stan Asians, Stan Asians stand in big platforms and talk about the great work they've done in the Western Cape. Yes, they have in the suburbs, in Constantia. Yes, they have in Landado and, and, and Camps Bay for that international dollar and that international pound and... And, and, and those communities, but not for our community. Mm-hmm. So both black and colored both black and have colored. been neglected in the Western Cape. And if they don't look at each other right now and say, how do we create a structure where we can either form a coalition 
to come together and say, we are going this way so that we ensure that there's representation. There's someone that represents us in government. There's um, someone that is able to speak up on our behalf when it comes to housing, education, policing. You're going to tell me after 30 years, they speak about 30 years, they are the best governed province in comparison to what? What are you comparing it to? It's between you and the ANC government. And the ANC government took over from the apartheid government and they needed to rectify what was created Done wrong by, by you. you. Mm. And again, we are not condemning or dismissing the corruption. But what are you comparing it to? So a government, I, a, a government of national unity is 100% needed. But it is a government of national unity that should represent South Africa as the diverse country that it is. So you have the, the Northwest looking at a specific political party. You have Limpopo looking at a specific political party. You have the Western Cape looking at a specific, specific political party. So when they are in government, they can represent their people and their problems. You cannot have one political party saying we want to rule. Yes, on a, on a, on a, in, on a national level, 100%, we should have. Because there's a lot of things that need to change in this country. A lot of things. Do you know I used to think South Africa has the best constitution in the world? I do. That's what we've been told. They told us we have the best constitution. And I read the constitution. I thought, wow, incredible constitution. We do. We are all free. <laughs> we have freedom of choice. We have freedom of movement. We have freedom of religion. We have a right to housing, etc., etc., etc. And it looks good on paper. Then when you read certain things and you're like, no. Like what? property rights explain to me one of let me ask you a question if i have to ask you about let's say the eff right yeah. or i ask you about now the mk party um and is azapo if i'm not mistaken it's azapo yeah. yeah what are they fighting for land they're fighting for land yeah so you've got these political parties that are fighting for land which is very important land is very important right yeah but at the same time, our, <laughs> our law allows anyone across the globe to come into South Africa and buy property. Now, is property not land? Yeah, it is. So how, is that, how, do, how does that work? So they've created a constitution that was beneficial to perpetuate or continue, I'm going to say, financial segregation in South Africa. But they did it through the constitution. Jo, 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 jo. Say, say that again, Samantha. <laughs> they have created a constitution that allows them to continuously perpetuate financial segregation in South Africa, but through the constitution. So Cape Town is a very... Ex how many people can buy houses in Cape Town? <laughs> very few. Who buys houses in Cape Town? It's mostly international community exactly. or, or the successful people of this country. Right. Because the constitution allows anyone to come into South Africa and buy property. And property is land. So now you've got the EFF, you've got Mkwento Wesizwe, you've got Azapo fighting for land. But at the same time, you've got a constitution that allows anyone to come in and, and buy the very land that you're speaking about. Mm, and buy it next to nothing with their euro, dollars and pounds. Exactly. You've got people that have a thousand hectares of land. What mm. are you doing with a thousand hectares of land? But they come in and they buy and they buy and they buy. And then on the one side, we're saying land expropriation. And on the other side, they come in and they buy the land and then they can present you with the very same title deeds that they are going after a lot of the farmers that cannot present the title deeds, but these people will be able to present you with a title deed and then what? Mm. So, so, so you think the DA, and, and I'd I would have loved for us to extend on that issue of land. It's just uh, for the sake of time and some other topics that I would like to cover. Maybe let's move on. Let's still talk about the uh, 2024 elections mm. and um, the, the outcomes, the outcome in the Western Cape. Mm. Do you think the DA will perform at its worst than all the other elections ever, this election in the Western Cape? I think they should, based on what has happened. And if they don't, then you 100% know that those elections are rigged. And if they do, who do you think the voters, the, their votes are going to go to? 
Let me not say their votes. Let me say where who do you think it will come from? Yeah. So there's something that I read. I don't know if you, I think you saw where during COVID there was a group of Europeans that came into South Africa, right? Or after COVID, before COVID or something. And because you can buy land in South Africa, you own property, and depending on the amount of money you bring into the country, you can get citizenship, right? So there was a case where they were speaking about dual citizenship, who can vote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I remember I, I was like, maybe I'm being a bit paranoid, but could it be that they, because remember, the DA have intentionally promoted Cape Town as now recently a digital nomad city, right? They've intentionally promoted it across the globe for people to come into Cape Town, but they promote it to a specific group of people. Now, if you have enough money and you can get your citizenship, then you have someone like Phil Craig saying, I have now started a referendum party and I want Cape Town. On which basis? He's got citizenship because he's got money. So he can vote. So he can vote. Because how did he register a party? So my point is that we could be shocked and we'll have people voting there. And we don't know where the votes came from. Mm. But if you look at the numbers, the numbers will then need to align. If you look at the demographics, they will say, this is the amount of people that have registered. This is the amount of people that are South African, etc., etc., etc. So the majority of the voters, if it comes from the colored people, I don't know. <laughs> If it comes from black people, I don't know. It clearly means that if that is the case, then I'm telling you now that our country suffers from Stockholm Syndrome. Mm. Because how are you going to vote for the very same people that I've shown you over a specific period of time that their interest is not for you? The, for them, they are vested in a specific group of people, which is their own people. And they have never looked. I, I remember they interviewed, um, what is this young guy's name? I don't know if he's the mayor or what of Cape Town. Where they asked him, do you think we'll get to a point where the Western Cape or South Africa will never have any more shacks? And he said no. Right? And the mm. guy said, why? And he said no, because unfortunately governance A, B and C. Right? But then there was an article released that said apparently the DA did not use up their full budget for housing. Mm. But then you look at Google Etu, and you look at Mitchell's Plain, and you look at Kailicha, and you look at what happened with the rains, you've got a budget that is for housing, and you are saying that those shacks will continue to remain there. Why? When you haven't used up the, the full budget. So it's very intentional. A lot of the things that happen in South Africa is very structured, and it's very intentional. There's a, I don't know if you read the bill where... It was submitted in the U.S. Congress. I didn't read it. <laughs> You're looking at me like... Which bill is that? So there was a bill, it was called, I can't, some H-something bill that was submitted. Okay. But in Congress, where they, the U.S. would like to review their relations with South Africa. No, I heard about it. The issue that just came out now after we took uh, Israel to the ICJ. Oh, yes, but mm. did you read the full bill? No, I haven't. I didn't read it, but what I heard for me in, uh, at the back of my mind, I just thought, okay, now we're about to suffer the consequences. So I read the full bill. So it, it, initially they said it's because it's the ICJ case because South Africa has now... No, so I went and I read the bill. And I read the bill again. So it starts off by saying that they are submitting this bill to Congress so that the U.S. can review the bilateral agreement, not with South Africa. They say the ANC government. ANC, mm -hmm. right? So it's an organization. Because the ANC government have not complied to or have not, um, whatever the agreement was, we don't know what the agreement was, since 1994, since the beginning of the agreement, the ANC government have continuously gone against what they have decided on or agreed upon, right? One of it being that they have continuously called out Israel as an apartheid state, They've now taken Israel up to the ICJ. Um, they have been very anti-Semitic towards um, Jewish people, right? And because of that, they need to review this. But then you continue to read it, and then it says, since 1994, the ANC government have not complied or, um, to what their obligation to this bilateral agreement was, right? And they have now aligned themselves to countries 
that the U.S. are not allies to, specifically Russia and China, right? And South Africa has now become a security threat to the U.S. because of their association. Then they go on to say that they need to review the agreements, right? And that they have classified documentation to support that the ANC government have been against their bilateral agreement. Now, South Africa as a country have never been able to produce the minutes for the Codesa negotiations. That classified documents that they are able to provide, which is a bilateral agreement that is not available on the internet, that you and I cannot have access to to say that the ANC government and the U.S. have agreed on the following terms based on us and what is beneficial to us, but it's classified. And because of that, we are now a threat to the U.S. government. Make it make sense. I need to, we all know it's because of BRICS. And Mr. Joshua Maponga said it last year. He's like, oh, those Americans are not going to go down without a fight. They're so not. this is all part of it. And, and what is more concerning is the DA went and asked for help from who? America. America. So what did they promise America that is in the bilateral mm. agreement that they are willing to comply with that the ANC government is not complying with? So they'll be channeling more funds to the DA. Exactly. So that's why I'm saying if any black or colored South Africans still continue to vote for the DA, then you must be suffering from Stockholm Syndrome because it has been so clear. It's something as basic as when there is any form of racial injustice, right? You look at the incident that happened in Bloom and you look at what happened to those three black boys where they tried to drown them. Mm. And also what happened in Phoenix. Exactly. Did the DA say anything? You are an inclusive party that's looking to represent South Africa as a nation. But at no point have I ever seen them go there and say, why are you guys doing this? Mm. So when we say 30 years, they always assume that, oh, you're harping on 30 years because apartheid was 30 years ago. No, we see racism, discrimination and inequality in South Africa on a daily and you don't call them out for it. Mm. And as a so-called inclusive democratic alliance party, should it not be your responsibility to do so? To hold the very same people, your people, accountable for the racism, discrimination, and inequality that you say does not exist, but we see it. And your own black leaders that you've groomed over the years left you. Yes. For what reasons? Because they leave and they keep quiet. I've never heard Usis Lindu and Mazubuga speak against the DA. I don't know what they made a sign. And shout out to my sister for going to Harvard to go get her education. Mm. But then again, if those leaders that we loved so mm. much, who were groomed by them, who are at the DA and then they leave, what are they saying about the rest of the other black people in their leadership? And also what are they saying about um, <laughs> the black vote and who votes for them? So it's interesting what you've just said now, like if you're black and you're still voting for the DA, I don't know, but then who should they vote for? At the moment, I, I, South Africa needs change, we, we, whether we like it or not. And whether it means that this change is going to come at the expense of South Africa having to collapse as a country first and then get back up, we need that change. If we don't, we will continuously have countries like the U.S. that can pass bills and threaten our national security as long as they are protected. And when you look at, I, I always tell people, vote for a political party that looks like you that looks like your problems and looks like your solutions. Because I do not see how the very same people that have oppressed you who say they've taken you out of oppression is going to help you when they've shown that they haven't. So for me personally, if you look at the, the political parties that I feel we should lean more towards, it will be the EFF, um, MK. UDM, I used to think I was like, okay, yeah, maybe. But I think you look at the, the ANC, unfortunately, they've been compromised. We really don't. You look at the ANC and you're like, I, I'm, not, I'm never dismissive of what it is that they've achieved. Never. I, I, I'm not dismissive. I always speak about the fact that you don't know what the ANC have taken over, right? And they've done a lot. However, they have been dismissive of the very same people that trusted them enough to put them in power, right? So that's that. But... In a country last, like South Africa, where 80% of the, let's say 90%, if you include the colored vote, right? 90% of the population is black. Who will represent us best in a so-called democracy? What, what is a democracy? How do you define a democracy? How you define a democracy is a, a country that 
um, caters for everyone. Yes. Diversity, inclusivity in, di in diversity. And majority? Black. Majority rules. Mm. That's a democracy. So if majority rules, does it not make sense that your top five political parties should be black? How is the DA the second biggest party in South Africa? Make it make sense. The DA should not even be in the top five political parties in South Africa, but they are there. That's why I felt very disrespected. Shout out to my brother, Mr. Um, David Mashabela. On, he interviewed Helen Ziller. And I heard Helen Ziller talk about, you can't, she's dictating on, anyway, that's another conversation. I, I saw anyway, that. That interview really irritated me. And just the arrogance of whiteness sometimes. It's very, and, and I think they don't understand, they, they, they. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, you know, <laughs> you just come and steal at my house and then after you come and tell me, like, you must move the bed now. You like, you came like? into my house. Now you're asking me, I must go live in the garage. <laughs> and while like... I am at it, I must make tea for you and I must respect <laughs> you. No. Know. It, so I saw, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I watched, you know, I was listening to Helen Zelena and I say, I looked at this and I think there's, uh, there's a lot of things that they did not see coming. A lot of things have happened simultaneously in South Africa. And a lot of it is you have Gen Zs that have come up. There's millennials. There's the in education in South Africa. Like a lot more um, black South Africans are educated. Like we are educated. We are, so they can't whitewash a lot of things anymore. They still try through propaganda and through mainstream media. Like the info that came out recently where... The survey that was done that apparently says that the DA has increased in certain provinces was done because they did it with DA members, mm. right? So Action SA took them up for that. But you look at that and I don't think, and I always say like, these people didn't see us coming. They thought that when you speak to a Samantha, you speak to a Spoo, you're still speaking to my ancestors. No, mm. no, you're not speaking to the same generation. So Helen Ziller saying that and she said it so confidently, shame. I was like, shame, auntie. Okay. She says, what did she say? If the EFF take over, this country will 100% collapse and the RAND will collapse. That's what she said, right? Mm. Now, first of all, we just had the situation of RAND manipulation where the RAND did collapse because of one individual. One person said, in the event where you do not keep Pravin Gordon there, I will make sure the RAND collapses. And he did that. And that is why she was able to laugh about it. Because I was like, you laughing because you know the structures. You know who pulls the strings. You know that it's possible. But South Africa needs change. We need a revolution. And that's why people take it very lightly when we say the 2024 should be our new 1994. Because the ANC government fought for liberation. The new generation needs to fight for equity. We need to fight for equity. And maybe they, at that moment, the negotiations was, guys, at the moment, our people are suffering. At the moment, our people are dying. So we've got our backs against the wall. So what is the most convenient thing for us to do now? We need to free our people. So let's take what they're offering us. Maybe, right? Because people always say, oh, Mandela was a sellout A, B, and C. But we don't know what the situation was. But right now, what is the most important thing for us to do? It was freedom. It's liberation, right? Was there a conversation that was held? And I, f I, I refuse to believe that people like Tabo Mbeki, Chris Honey, Jacob Zuma, um, Nelson Mandela, after those neg negotiations, I refuse to believe that those people went back home, sat around the table and said, okay, guys, they have offered us freedom. It's fine. They're not giving us the land. It's fine. But we need a plan. I refuse to believe they didn't have that conversation because myself being a solution-based person, driven person, do you want to tell me myself, you, Zbu, we're having a conversation. We're trying to approach a company. There's the five of us, right? We approach a company. We're not going to have a strategy on plan A, plan B, plan C. Our of course. Our country is only 30 years old. Our country is only 30 years old. So to assume that there was not a conversation held on how are we going to get back the equity in this country? And is there a strategy in place that will allow for one, the sunset clause? A lot of people didn't know about the sunset clause. The sunset clause, once it ends, what will happen? And then obviously there was, I'm going to say, this disruption of corruption in the ANC government, right? But 
there should have been a plan in place and i definitely think there's a plan in place are you going to do to the ANC what you did to the apartheid government or Me? what our parents did yeah i'm talking Am about I with your vote <laughs> yes i because mandela said that he gave that. us that permission right yes i'm going to do that with my vote I am there was I don't know if you saw there was an interview that Desmond Tutu did a few years ago where he said if the ANC government do not fix the mess right now the South Africans will do to them what we did to the apartheid yeah, government. Yeah, so that interview. Exactly. Yeah. Because we've gotten to a point where I must remember Gen Zs can only but judge the ANC government based on what they know. They yeah. don't know about apartheid because they were not here. They were not yeah. So all they know is that they have potholes they have load shedding they have an education system that does not work um that's all they know so they will judge the uh, the ANC government based on their experience so the ANC will say okay but during apartheid a b and c we will understand and i will even defend them to a certain degree you will understand but gen z do not understand for them it's like what do you mean all you need to do is fix this <laughs> and that's not and those are those are the, the 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 children that will vote in the up and coming elections and they will not vote based on the understanding of new colonialism or the understanding of apartheid it will be the understanding of what it is that they see now that affects them now is your vote the same or to the same party on all ballots or are you going to separate your votes based on national provincial etc mine is split a split my national vote is different to my provincial vote why so remember when i said we do need a government of national unity so government of national unity means that in all provinces everyone is represented equally gauteng is very different to northwest right we we like a business hub so If you look at everyone that's that it, it's very split. I I genuinely can't tell you who I think will take Gauteng. I don't. Um but when you look at a national le- level and you look at who has gained the most traction over a specific period of time um and who has laid out what it is that they are looking to achieve. I know exactly what I need to do. Okay. <laughs> I'm predicting the EFF to grow again. No, definitely. Very the, by by far. Leaps and bounds actually. The interesting province this year uh, and this is what I was saying I did a video a few days ago I think it was 2 weeks ago I don't know if it was last week I said for me the mm. outcomes of the 2024 elections in Gauteng I'm seeing a coalition government. Mm. Interesting province to look out for in these elections is KZN with the emergence of AK a few months ago your thoughts about KZN about MK let's no KZN politics KZN is poli- okay so the <laughs> and remember now it's led by a former president and somebody who comes from that province who's very loved and who's highly criticized by a lot of people and who comes and led the ANC before and has led the country before interesting interesting dynamic a one we didn't have 8 months ago never So you know when you 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 look at KZN and it's not and I I know people will say it, and it's not it's not a tribalistic thing I'm not but I am saying there's certain things that we need to be very conscious of as South Africans right What is the population of the Zulu nation It's very big I think we've got about 16 between we've got about 14 to between 14 to 20 million Zulu people in South Africa Right Now in the last elections the ANC won with how many votes? I don't know. 10. Okay. So if the ANC won with 10 million votes in the last elections, 10 million votes on nationals and KZN currently in terms of their population have more than that and those that are eligible to vote is more than 10 million. Does that not mean that they can take the nationals? I don't know. That's why I'm saying an inter- it's a, it is an interesting dynamic. Remember our, our when you look at South Africa in terms of 
who decides nationals in terms of provinces. It's Gauteng and KZN. Yeah, and those and, are the two. And, and don't rule out the IFP, and considering IFP. the history and, of the IFP. And as also, well. what happened? Did you see what the the manifesto launch looked like? No, I didn't. It was. I, I was so shocked. I was like, "You guys are still that big?" Of course, <laughs> was, in KZN. I, I know. Of they're course. huge. Yeah. They massive. So That's I why I'm at saying, the, don't rule out the IFP. Definitely not. Because you I'm, also have a lot of voices that are saying, "I'm going back to the IFP." Yes. But if the IFP decide that they need to, so that's what I'm saying. We need to ensure that the top five political, you guys, you know, even if it's three, the top three political um, parties in this country or top five have to be black, black political parties. There's no negotiating on that. You cannot tell me that we are okay with saying that those with the loudest voices is the DA. There's times where John Stevens his and speaks, and I'm like, you should not even have a voice. Respectfully, you should not have a voice. I mean, I would if there's even times like Njalo. Anyway. Do you understand? Like, you, you should not be able to dictate to the masses of the majority in South Africa what you feel is, the, is, is, is beneficial to them. When Even when you look at what Helen Ziller said, she said the economy will remove themselves. Who's the economy? It's them. Exactly. It's white foreign investors. That's the economy. Because majority of South African black people are not even part of the economy that they speak of. So it's them, do you understand? So mm. when you look at the top three political parties or the top four, I'm hoping, political parties in South Africa, if, if they are black and we need to amend certain bills in this country, we get a two-thirds majority. That's all. The country needs a two-thirds majority in order for us to amend the constitution. The constitution needs to be amended. It's not even... And this is coming from someone that used to think we've got the best constitution in the world. We do not. If we had the best constitution in the world, why have the other countries not adopted it? The U.S. speak about our, our constitution all the time. They quote our constitution when they are busy writing their, their thesis about South Africa. Their PhD is about, about South Africa and our constitution. But they've, none of them have adopted it. Why? Because it benefits them. There's two countries in the world, and I remember seeing this. There's only two countries in the world whose I, what do you call it, reserve bank, the reserve bank, the country is, is privately owned. There's only two countries in the world. There's, it's 13 it's that's part well. in the U.S. Mm. It's only us in the U.S. There's other countries that's 13, but they partly national and then partly private, pri privately owned. But fully privately owned reserve bank is South Africa and the U.S. Mm. So that bilateral agreements that they speak of, that we don't know about, we really need to see those bilateral agreements. We need to see what the conversation was. And that's why people say, we're not going to vote because you have to vote. Because these people, when they speak, when they go to the IMF, they're speaking on your behalf. They go to the IMF and they say, we want 500 billion for South Africans. It's you. They speak on our behalf. So when you say I'm not going to vote, do you think my vote is going to count for you? No. You have to vote. Yo, I'm looking forward to our second round. This is like the first. There's so many other things that I still want to touch. Mm -hmm. And we've run out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank You're you incredible. You're amazing. Thank you. I'm looking Thank forward you. to you starting a podcast. You have to. You've got so much in your mind and I see your videos, I see on all social media platforms and you're, you're not only an intelligent mind, I love the fact that you kutele. You know, you've got the energy to create the content that makes people think mm. and you create debates. And as you say, people sometimes come for you. I love people like that. Over the past couple of years, those are the people that I've been engaging with on these podcasts. Mm. And that's what I love about your content. So I'm looking forward to sitting down with you again and I'm looking forward to seeing your growth and your voice just um, amplify, you know, in, in, the, in these social media streets. I'm going back on radio. I'm also looking forward to our radio interview. Oh, that would be lovely. <laughs> Congratulations, though, on going yeah. back. It was, it was really just a matter of time. It was <laughs> really you. a matter of time. So You're well amazing, done. Man. Well done. Thank, Thank you so you much so for your time. And I'm looking for, I'm not going to make it baba as if like this is the last time. So we're going to have another radio, we're going to have a radio interview mm. and we're going to have another one um, of these interviews because there's all, all sorts of other issues that mm. I, I wanted us to talk about. But thank you so much. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being incredible. Thank you for challenging people's minds. Thank you for stretching people's minds. Thank mm -hmm. you for not being afraid to also get challenged, mm -hmm. attacked, confronted, and debated. I think that's incredible in these mm -hmm. days that we're living in, especially, you know, voices like yours are 
Black Sisters mm. and Young yeah. as well. So thank you for your contributions. No, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Let, let's <laughs> wrap it up and speak your, your last words to other younger um, Samanthas out there, man. Speak to those young ladies and speak to those students that are at varsities or those young adults that are starting their careers. I, I think I'm going to leave them with exactly what I think has allowed me to grow into the person that I am. And that is, especially to young ladies in, in, in South Africa, that you need to be more than just a face. You need to be more than just a face. You need to ensure that you empower your mind, you empower yourself in such a manner that you are able to engage each other on conversations that will contribute to the, the development of this country, which will in turn, in 10, 20, 30 years, create structures and systems that looks different to the systems that we are dealing with now. And it can only but happen when you decide to do something more outside of, I'm going to say, the vanity of social media. Earlier on, you mm -hmm. said a lot of people think you come from a wealthy family. They do. How have you handled people who think you've had it easy because you're pretty, pretty privileged? <laughs> and light skin privilege on top <laughs> of that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, so, um... Yeah, people think I come from, I mean, I don't come from, a, I'm, I come from a good enough family. My family yeah. wasn't, you know, we had our moments, like hectic moments, but it was up and down. It was extreme moments, it's extreme moments of having a lot and then having little. Um, but I have gotten to a point where I can say I've done well for myself. I've done really well for myself. And my sister, my family as a whole, you know, they've, they've really, you look at them and people that know us from Porch really look at it and it's like, you, you guys have really, you know. So yeah, has my so-called pretty privilege played a role? A hundred percent. I can tell you that much, whether people are willing to acknowledge it or not. You do know and you realize that people tend to treat certain people that look a specific way different, you know. Um, it does help to be kind. I think I'm a kind person. <laughs> I, I always I'm like no they helped me because I was nice and maybe they did right but it does play a role and as a woman if you are able to combine your beauty with brains literally the world is your oyster trust me you you are able to take on conversations with people especially when they undermine you because they don't see you coming they never see you coming and that's probably one of the best things that I have been equipped with how crazy is it that they never see it coming though? Because it's like subconsciously the mind doesn't expect a pretty person has got amazing brains. Mm. They don't. No one ever, it, it's, it's always a shock and I'm like, um, and mind you, I never used to see myself as being pretty. I never, because I wasn't, uh, you can see how people respond to you, you know, especially in the community that we grew up. I had this big, we used to call us the, the, the Poodle Gang, myself and my sisters, we have our curly afros, etc. you know. So they treated us differently. It was more specifically, so more evident in, in Joburg, right? But when you start moving in different spaces, especially in no Joburg North, because it's more integrated, it's more diverse, you, yeah, it's there. It's it's a hundred percent there. It, it's not even. I I saw what's her name Elsa Majimba was speaking about it, where she actually said, she kind of did like a social experiment, I guess, where she decided to intentionally dress up a specific way, do her makeup a specific way, um, speak to people a specific way, and now that she's in Los Angeles, she realized that the doors that opened to her before, yes, people respected her because she's done well for her, etc. But now that she's kind of tapped into the so-called pretty privilege, the response is very different. Sure. It's interesting, man, your answer. And I just imagine what you guys go through. Uh, for the past couple of years, I've grown my hair and I've mm. just let my beard uncombed. Mm. I've received different... Tri and mind you, I'm one of the popular, maybe top 10 or top 20 most popular people in this country. 100%. Imagine 100%. me being so-called a celebrity. <laughs> Just the fact that I've let my hair and I leave my beard uncombed, mm. the type of treatment I get. <laughs> what is the treatment? <laughs> it's different from when I was speaking English and wearing suits and you know what I mean? Like, yeah. geez, man, people's perception, people's minds, yes. right? People have a, a they, they've, get a, they've got an idea of what a smart person looks like, of what an educated person looks like, of what a businessman looks like. Mm. And because of that, they will treat, it's, it's like when you go to events, what is the first thing people ask you? Yeah, dress code. What do you do for a living? Yeah, or what do you do? Yeah. What yeah. do you do for a living? So they can decide how to treat you based mm. on what you do. 
It's very weird. Even people that I've known for a while, they're associated with um, weed, Rastafaranism, <laughs> falling off, broke. When are you twassing? When are you announcing that you're a Sangoma? And just the treatment is different. Really? I'm telling Even you. Okay, but are you going to twassa though? Please don't. Uh, no, 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 no. No, I'm not twassing. And if I, if I, if my, um, based on my history, my family, and it, the calling comes mm. and I'm meant to toss, I will. I'll mm. gladly accept the calling. Mm. Um, but for now, no. I was going to say, please do not go into Asa when you're de depressed. <laughs> no, I'll never be depressed. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'll ever be depressed again. <laughs> because a lot of the time when you hear people that have decided, especially celebrities, you look at it and you're like, I feel like it happens at a time where things... They went, went through the yeah, most. Yeah, you know when you're yeah, going yeah. through the most and you're like, maybe I need to go and center myself. Yeah. So if it's a calling, 100%, you know, but yeah. do it from a clear, sober mind. Yeah. So that when we have these conversations, it's not... No. Bones that you're going to be throwing or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm glad that I, you know, I went through what I went through at an elderly so, age. Yeah. So it's just maturity and just being comfortable with yourself. So what? it doesn't matter what people say and how mm. they've been treating me or all of that. I'm mature enough to understand, yeah. right? They, you know, they always reflect whatever they're going through in their own minds or me. Yeah. And I'm, all, I'm always okay with it. But it's, mm. it, it's been interesting. It's been an interesting experience. The past five years have been very interesting. What and did then you do, the other day I, I, I posted something and I said, if I were to cut my hair and wear a suit now just for two years, mm. I know the treatment also will switch yeah. like this. It will. Crazy. Interesting how people are. Eh? It will 100%. <laughs> it's like now, if you can just start wearing the treatment mm. will be different. Yeah, it is. It's very, very different. I guess that's mm -hmm. why they even have sayings like, um, dress how you'd like to be treated. Be treated. I guess it's people's actually, perceptions. Yeah. Actually, now that you mention it, it makes sense. It's mm. perception. Because people do, they treat you very differently. Yeah. Very, very differently. But it has also taught me a lot. Mm. It's taught me a lot about myself as well. You, you, you'll understand more when the, when the new book does come out, guys. But it's beautiful when you're comfortable in your own skin. And you don't seek no validation from any outside forces. Mm. But, um, yeah, grow, growing up is, is, is beautiful. I never signed up for this. I didn't know it will be like this when really? I was a kid. <laughs> really? Yeah. What, what did you want to become when you were younger? When I was young, I've always wanted to become a successful radio DJ. Mm. You know, I've always loved radio. Wow. And I achieved it. And um, God has been great. I think it opened up a whole lot of other doors as well. So I've, I've, you, you, said it to, you said it yourself earlier about yourselves. Um, I'm always grateful to God. I think I've done mm. fairly well for myself mm. too. And I know a lot of people are proud of me. And sometimes as much as I'm comfortable with myself, mm. um, it makes me uncomfortable when people that care about me are concerned. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But anyway, I'm looking forward to our, our, our next interview. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Samantha you. Johnson, follow on all social media platforms. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for having me. I'll see Thank you guys on the next video. Danko! <laughs> <laughs>